This is FRM Part 1, Book 3, Financial Markets and Products, and the chapter on the basic principles of central clearing. And before I get into the slide deck, I just want to kind of give you a sense of what's going on here. We've talked a little bit about this in the previous chapter. We'll introduce some new topics here in this chapter. But the idea is to facilitate trade between and among investors and traders and institutional investors globally. You know, the idea is that you got two people who get together and agree to do something in the future in these derivative markets. And the sense is that when these two people get together, they're probably not going to trust each other just on the simple human principles of trust. So there has to be a mechanism under which these two investors can agree to trade at some time in the future so that they're confident that that trade is going to be executed on the maturity date of the contract. So there kind of has to be somebody in charge. And if this is an organized exchange, the obvious notion is that, well, the exchange is going to be in charge of that, and that'll be supported by the financial institutions that are part of that exchange. But when you have an over-the-counter market, you know, this is an electronic market that exists globally throughout the world. There's no, there's no central trading place. The idea of a central clearing house or a central clearing party uh, becomes a little bit more complex. And so that's what we're going to address in this slide deck. So the learning objectives look like this. We're going to provide examples of the mechanics of a CCP, advantages and disadvantages. I mean, that's always a learning objective. Talk about margin requirements, novation and netting. And then at the end, we'll ask a really important question. Okay, we're doing all this central clearing. Does that really have an impact on what goes on on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange or in the treasury market or in the currency markets? And of course, the answer to that question has to be yes. And then the follow-up question is, well, well, how much of an impact is there? So let's get to a simple uh, discussion on the mechanics of a central counterparty. All right, so what we're doing is clearing. It refers to the use of a CCP to, boy, there's that great word, mitigate. Of course, that means lessen. I don't want to use the word eliminate because we're never going to eliminate the risks. But what we're trying to do is we're trying to look at this other party and say, you know what? I may not trust you individually, but because of this system and because of the way clearing works with the CCPs, I'm willing to put up a promise that I'm going to either provide capital or take delivery in this derivative market and at some time in the future. All right, so we're worried about the default risk, the default of that trading counterparty. Now, what happens is that the central counterparty essentially writes a contract with both individuals or both institutions. And so it becomes the legal counterparty. And so if you and I are trading and I'm in Pennsylvania and you're in Saskatchewan, we really don't need to visit. We don't need to shake hands. We don't need to know each other. We both trust that central counterparty to keep track of all this stuff. And when something goes on, if we're first forced to settle, maybe it's daily, maybe it's weekly, or, or maybe it's at the maturity date of the contract, then there is a system in place so that the contract can be honored. So note my first circle point there provides a guarantee uh, that it will honor the terms and conditions of the original trade, even in the event that uh, you or I defaults. Now, of course, the central counterparty is not going to do this just because it's a nice person, right? So they have to be financed. So they're going to collect money. They're going to charge some kind of membership fee so that we can uh, cover potential losses. Uh, let's suppose that there are six entities and that's represented by B. Let's suppose those are just dealer banks. and. Suppose these six dealer banks are trading between and among each other. And if you look at that little diagram on the left-hand side, boy, there are so many arrows in there. It's getting me dizzy. I hope I don't get vertigo before the end of this, uh, uh, before the end of this video. But when I look at that left slide, um, um, I can't help but think, boy, that looks an awful lot like anarchy. And those of you who've ever been to... Uh, you know, the New York Mercantile Exchange or the Chicago Mercantile Exchange or any of the uh, organized exchanges in derivative markets throughout the world, you'll kind of get the sense that, my gosh, maybe this is anarchy. I mean, it's just total chaos. 
And I remember one of the first times that I went to the uh, New York Mercantile Exchange with my students. I, I talked to the guy who was taking us around and I said, man, oh man, how do they keep track of all that stuff? And he said, you know what? It looks like chaos, but it's really not. We're completely organized. And so that's what the right hand diagram shows you. You eliminate lots and lots of those arrows. So notice the first circle point there under advantages it reduces the interconnectedness. It increases the transparency and then it uh, it increases the operational efficiency. Of course, of course, all of these things are going to be byproducts of that central counterparty. Now, this term novation, that's a legal term, contract novation. This is the legal process, you know, under which the central counterparty uh, places itself in between the party over here and the party over here. So just what I said in that previous slide, uh, the CCP becomes the buyer to every seller and the seller to every buyer. All right. So what, what this means is that that initial contract then ceases to exist. And so the counterparties then no longer have counterparty risk with respect to each other, but there's counterparty risk with respect to the CCP. So that's why the central counterparty has to be well financed. I mean, this is going to be somebody who's called like, you know, the Rock of Gibraltar counterparty. It's not going to be a financial institution like me, like Jim's weak financial institution. Who, who would want to clear their trades through Jim's weak financial institution? Because who knows if I'm going to be around tomorrow, let alone next week. Now, the important thing, of course, is that the central counterparty then does not bear uh, the market risk, the net market risk, but the original two uh, traders do. Now, of course, to enter a trade, what's happening is that two individuals or two institutions are at least electronically shaking hands and saying, all right, we're going to trade at some time in the future. But in order for this to work, the, uh, uh, the CCP requires margins. And so they, the CCP says to both people, hey, look, we want you to put up a margin. And the, the analogy to playing poker is, is probably not uh, is not too outrageous you know in order to get in the game you have to you have to ante up right so you put the ante in whatever that is one dollar or five dollars or a million dollars if you're a wealthy uh, poker player but you put that in there so you can kind of get in the game and that's really what the margin does and so that collateral of course it, it could be cash uh, uh, but uh, most of the time it can be just something as simple as treasury bills or maybe some other kinds of extremely extremely low risk uh, security you know, those of you who have been listening to my videos know that I love to give movie examples. Do you remember in that great James Bond movie, Casino Royale, he's playing that one dude and he takes all the money from the one dude and the guy gives him the car keys. And so Bond is looking at him and saying, OK, I'll, I'll take that as collateral. Um, you probably can't put a car in here for a CCP, but anything that is highly liquid. So note at that second block point, initial margin must be posted when initiating the contract. And then there is a maintenance margin. So you put this initial margin in, let's say it's $10,000. And then every day the contracts are revalued to reflect those current market conditions. Of course, they have to be revalued. And so that the value of that contract is going to go up and the value of that contract is going to go down. So there's a winner and a loser. And whenever whenever that value falls below the maintenance margin, then then one of the parties, the losing party, is going to get a margin, uh, a margin call. And so that margin call is kind of like kind of like that poker ante where you have to put some more money in. You have to put some more money in to call if someone raises, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not a poker player, but I do watch enough movies so I can understand that. All right. So how about uh, how about the following? This is really cool. Loss mutualization. Um, so losses that are uh, in excess of any kind of resources contributed by uh, the defaulting party, because remember, it, there's going to be a margin. So there's going to be something there. And then this is a legal and binding contract. So there are some other assets that might be available uh, to cover those losses. But then uh, this loss mutualization is uh, a fund in which all of the CCP members contribute so that those are like deposits that can be taken out to cover those losses. And whenever I think of something like this, I always go back to one of those one of the great uh, Harrison Ford movies from the 1980s where 
uh, he's looking for a killer and he goes into the Amish community. And uh, we learned during that movie, there's a young married couple and of course they're poor. They don't have a house, they don't have a barn. So everybody contributes to building the barn. And then later on, we learned that, boy, if any of these barns uh, burn down or, or fall over, then everybody kind of contributes. So I think the analogy there is, uh, is a little bit appropriate. So those funds that are in this default fund then can help absorb those losses. Now, of course, loss mutualization encourages more members to enter the market. And so what this means then, that if this risk, think about the risk being spread between and among more people, that the per risk, the risk per unit or risk per member then declines. Of course, as everything, I teach my children, there's a marginal cost and a marginal benefit. Boy, there's gonna be some other problems and we'll talk about those in, in a few slides. Uh, here are some obvious advantages of central clearing. You know, transparency, of course, that's a great word politically these days. I'm not sure what it means politically, but of course, in financial markets and financial contracts, transparency means that, you know, whatever's there, then that's what it is. You, you need to know all of those things. Now, this is the argument that I always give to a doctor's office or the car dealership or whoever it is I'm dealing with, with something that's important. Hey, just, just tell me the rules. Tell me I have to wait five hours for my car to be fixed. Tell me that now. Don't make me wait five hours and say, oh, can you believe how long it took for us to fix your car? Just tell me up front. So that transparency notion is that just tell me up front what's going on, right? I, tell, I teach my students all the time, identify the risks, quantify the risks, and then manage the risk. And so that transparency, of course, is important in all three of those elements, but that first part is more important, being able to identify the risks if things are transparent. Uh, of course, this central clearing makes it really easy to get out of the contract. So you can terminate the position, you can open new ones. So this is called offsetting. Uh, there's loss mutualization, which we talked about. There's legal and operational efficiency. That, that makes perfect sense. Default management, I mean, this is kind of a cool thing. And then improved market liquidity. Didn't I mention that right at the very beginning of the slide deck? This is really, this is really the first part is that if you if you remember back in the old days like you know 150 170 years ago these these were all forward contracts that were designed to meet the needs of each individual client and there was really no secondary market for these things uh, how about some disadvantages here let's let's talk about uh, let's talk about moral hazard so the presence of a third party that promises to assume all of the counterparty risk all right so what does that mean that that means then that um, if this risk is being spread that spread around uh, per unit and per risk unit of member, like I said before, that if I come to you and trade and you're like some powerful financial institution and I'm just Jim's weak financial institution, you're gonna be less likely to perform your due diligence and say, you know what, Jim may or may not be able to pay because that risk is spread around. So that's, that's called moral hazard. You know, what did I just say? Identify the risk, quantify the risks, manage the risk. So you're going to be less likely to do those things because there's somebody else out there who's going to contribute to any losses that, uh, that you might have. Uh, adverse selection. I mean, what's happening here with the central clearing is that... Uh, is that we're acting kind of like an insurance company. And so insurance companies, they worry about adverse selection all the time. I mean, look, when am I gonna go buy a life insurance policy? I'm gonna go buy one the day before I die, right? I'm gonna go say, give me a million dollars worth of life insurance. And by the way, I'm, I'm really healthy, <laughs> even though I'm not really healthy. And so that's what uh, adverse selection means that that one party has more information than the other party. And that's part of the identifying the risks element that I like to teach my students is that, uh, boy, you need to know uh, with whom you're trading. Uh, this bifurcation, so we're chopping it up into two parts, uh, cleared versus non-cleared. And so remember that that in the on the organized exchanges, these contracts are all standardized. And then in the over-the-counter market, I mean, there's lots of standardization, but there's also the ability to design and tailor unique contracts for the specific needs of individual institutional investors. And so the, the notion then between which ones are cleared and which ones are non-cleared becomes just a little bit more problematic. 
How about the possibility that if we're running into some kind of financial distress, if we're if if the economy is shrinking just a little bit, that the central clearing party then says something like, oh my gosh, I'm so worried about this risk. I'm going to increase the margin requirements just at the time when you don't need those. So we call that pro-cyclicality. Uh, now, remember those bilateral markets, that was that first left-hand diagram that I showed you before. Um, Let's just take a quick example. If there are two distinct trades between these two parties, they each have their own cash flows. And so this bilateral trading can uh, can bring about several different kinds of problems. And so if we're if we're going to, you know, we have these in this example, we have two distinct trades. So we're going to have an exchange of gross amounts. We're going to have that done at least twice, if not more. There's the rise of uh, of settlement risk and then and in the event of a default, um, the, sur the surviving party will most likely have to terminate all other trades. So there's this closeout deal. Like if, if X and Y have, you know, in this example, two trades, but suppose they have 10 trades and you default on one, X defaults on one, well, then what happens to the other ones? Now, these bilateral markets, of course, you know, they develop these net netting methods. And so, um, uh, this payment netting means that if I owe you five and you owe me four, we're not going to we're not going to trade five and four dollars. And so this applies to close out netting as well. Now, here's that last uh, that last learning objective. Um, you know, we've got this risk uh, uh, in the United States. We call these things, these financial institutions that too big to fail. I'm not quite sure what that means, but it just means that you got some giant financial institution and if it fails, that it's going to have repercussions through the larger markets and it make, may make its way on to Main Street. And so what, uh, what some people suggest is that these, uh, the central clearing might actually increase this market risk or the systemic risk. That's the kind of a recent word. Um, by way of increasing margin requirements or increasing member fees or just kind of pursuing uh, avenues that are going to increase uh, the volatility in the market, especially, especially during times of turbulence. And so I encourage you to go back and read, you know, that last chap, that last paragraph in this chapter where it discusses something that sounds like, you know, central clearing is really good. Lots, lots and lots of good stuff in here, but it's not going to completely result in an ideal and a perfect world. And that takes us through this chapter.